Welcome everybody to tonight's program, AUW Naperville Area, Illinois panel discussion on perspectives on gun violence. Um, I am Sue Topp. I'm the co-president of Naperville AUW group. And with me are my co-president, Barb Billardello. And our moderator tonight is Ann Swanson. She's our co-vice president of programming. And we have three panelists that you'll meet shortly. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to thank our panelists before we begin for taking the time to inform us on their perspectives on gun violence. Um, our panelists are Chief Robert Marshall, Chief of Naperville Police. He's a 28 year veteran of the Naperville Police Department and became chief in 2012. Our next panelist is Leslie Ruffing. She is a group leader for Mom Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, which is a grassroots nonpartisan group of Americans fighting for public safety measures that can protect people from gun violence and keep families safe. The group is not anti-gun, they are anti-gun violence. And the organization believes that respecting gun rights and protecting people go together. Tammy Tunnell is the Downstate Outreach Coordinator for Gun Violence Prevention Education Center, Illinois. Um, it's a council against, against, sorry, handgun violence. She also works part-time for DCFS um, countdown to 21 meetings, as well as part-time as the Downstate Community Outreach Coordinator, um, educating Illinois Illinoisans on the firearms restraining order. She's joining us actually from Springfield. Um, so um, Chief Marshall, if you would start, give us a little introduction of yourself and your perspective on gun violence. Sure, be glad to. I, I thank you for the invitation. I think this is the second time, uh, I think Leslie and I, uh, had a, had a session a while ago over at City Hall, right, Leslie? That was a very interesting evening, as I recall. So uh, yes, my name is Bob Marshall. I'm the police chief with the city of Naperville. Been the police chief since 2012. And uh, you know, as, as we discuss uh, gun violence uh, this evening, uh, one of the, uh, the things that troubles our department is in 2020, we've seen dramatic increases in really three areas. Uh, one is gun incidents, number two is domestic violence, and number three is mental health. Uh, we are on pace in Naperville to set uh, records in these three areas. So obviously gun violence is attached to every single one of those uh, uh, incidents that I just talked about, domestics as well as uh, uh, mental health. And they're all uh, intertwined. And uh, we've seen some things in 2020 uh, that I haven't seen in my over 30 years in law enforcement. Our year began uh, very optimistically, talking about our goals, our strategic plan for the police department. And then in March, uh, we got hit with the pandemic. And while uh, many organizations, city departments uh, sheltered in place, the police and fire department did not. We still responded to calls for service in our community and at great risk to, uh, to our officers as well as our firefighters. Uh, to date, unfortunately, we've had 22 officers that have tested positive for COVID. So that continues to be a struggle for our police department and you know, managing the calls of service that our residents still expect us to handle and yet protect the, uh, the health and safety of our employees. Uh, then uh, we moved into the summer and as everybody uh, recalls, we had uh, periods of social unrest that again, we have not seen in Naperville. I think the last time we had a significant uh, demonstration was uh, around 2001, I think, or 2002 with uh, the Reclaim the Streets organization that came to Naperville. So uh, this was uh, uh, as a result of the George Floyd killing in Minneapolis it impacted our department greatly with, uh, with responding to public demonstrations and protests throughout the summer months. And now, as we got into the fall, we're seeing uh, a tremendous increase in COVID-19 uh, cases again, as was predicted that during the fall, we'd see a second wave. And we clearly have felt that here in our community, our state, and our police department. So those are my introductory remarks. 
So I, um, like so many Americans, remember exactly where I was the day of the Sandy Hook uh, shooting. And what I remember most vividly is my one-year-old in the seat behind me and just not being able to fathom as a new mother what just happened. So that's sort of what started my um, involvement with the gun violence prevention world. Um, in 2016, I made the decision to really devote more of my time, more of my free volunteer time to the organization. Um, in, 20, in 2017, in the wake of the Parkland um, incident event, um, that's when I became part of the leadership team for the Naperville group. And then last year ended up taking over as the group lead um, in anticipation of 2020. Um, moms, we do a lot of election work. We have gun sense candidates now that we give distinctions to and endorsements to, and we work very hard to elect gun sense candidates to on all levels of, from the state level to the federal level to the, obviously to the presidential level. So, um, you know, I took over, I wanted to be the leader um, this year thinking this was going to be event after event after event and all this, you know, sort of exciting election work. We still did all that. It just looked a heck of a lot different than what we had anticipated, but I'm so proud of what we've accomplished and, um, uh, moving forward, you know, as, as Chief Marshall sort of alluded to, COVID has just worsened things so much. And the big thing we worry about is just this huge influx of guns into our country and what that is going to look like um, next year as we do, I think, I hope, move into a more normal world again at some point in 2021 and people start to gather a lot more and everything kind of turned to normal. What is the impact of all of those all these new gun owners to uh, Americans. Hi, I'm Tammy Tunnell. Uh, thanks for having me tonight. I am the downstate outreach coordinator for, um, it used to be Illinois Council Against Handgun Violence, and then we became um, Gun GPEC, Gun Prevention Education Council, Illinois Coalition Against Handgun Violence, and we are changing now to be One Aim Illinois. So, um, but I became involved uh, about 18 months ago with the organization. Uh, for many, many years, I worked in domestic violence. Um, so I then left domestic violence and went to work for the Teen Parent Service Network through DCFS. Uh, and at one day, it just struck me that we kept losing our kids to gun violence. And I, I thought, you know, and instead of sitting around going, somebody should do something about that, I decided to do something about that. So I left that job, hooked up with the organization and, uh, and just continue to give presentations, get information out. Um, and I was the one that would be running around, like would drop in on people like Chief Marshall and say, hey, you know, do you know about firearm restraining orders? Do you know where to get the paperwork? You know, have you done any? Um, uh, I was running up and down the state last summer, uh, which was great fun. I saw parts of the state I probably would have never seen otherwise. And then COVID hit and put me on Zoom. So now I do a lot of that over Zoom. Uh, hopefully one day I'll be back out on the road uh, doing that work. So currently we're just moving forward, trying to get the word out about the firearm restraining order. And uh, we're gonna continue to push out information any way we can. Statistics show that abused women are five times more likely to be killed by their abuser if the abuser has firearms. Since COVID-19 began, the rate of gun purchases doubled or even recently quadrupled. How has this impacted domestic violence against women and what can be done to address this societal problem? Uh, first of all, some of the data I've seen with the, uh, the increase in uh, the purchase of firearms and ammunition is overwhelming. And uh, our, in fact, our police department, we, we have a hard time ordering ammunition. Uh, currently the estimates there's 250 to 280 million firearms in the United States. And you think about our population in the United States, last I heard it was around 330 million. So you look at between 250 and 280 million firearms are in this country currently, uh, which obviously you know, uh, concerns us in law enforcement, especially when we see the number of violent crimes being committed with firearms. And, and as I mentioned during the introduction, uh, the statistics we see in gun-related incidents in our city is dramatically going up, uh, specifically related to domestic violence. Uh, during the COVID 
period when people were required by the governor's executive order to shelter in place, uh, the number one call that we received from residents was domestic violence. So for example, in 2020, the first nine months, we've had 907 calls re re regarding domestic violence. Uh, 394 of those were domestic batteries. Uh, for example, just a year ago, in the entire year, it was just 1,000 calls of domestic violence. So we, uh, and that's only nine months so far, nine months of data. So a year ago it was 1,000, the batteries were 440. So we still have to get the data on October, November, and December. So that's three more months of domestic calls. And we are averaging about at least three to four domestic violence calls per day. So uh, the impact on, on the firearms uh, goes back to the summer when uh, operational groups in Black Lives Matter called for the defunding and the abolishment of police. Many of the citizens that, that I came in contact with said, okay, if, if the police department is defunded and abolished, then we as citizens have to protect ourselves. So that was the spike in the purchase of firearms because citizens felt that if the police can't keep us safe, then we're gonna arm ourselves in, 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 so that we can defend our, our families and our, our property. So that is related to some of the spikes in purchasing of firearms and ammunition we, we saw uh, this year. Uh, so what are we doing in the city of Naperville? One of the things, we, we have three social workers and uh, we are one of the few police departments that has that many social workers. We understand our officers respond to domestic violence and they de-escalate that, that call in the moment. But what, what concerns us is the officers move on to other calls. So years ago, we went and we got a specific position called a victim advocate. And Gianna, her caseload, because I just checked today, her caseload is 433 cases right now. Now, these are all follow-ups to domestic violence. And one of the things that concerned me as the police chief and uh, women in our community is they're fearful of the criminal justice system. They don't know how to work, work through it. They don't trust the criminal justice system. So one of the things Gianna does is that she meets with the victims, she does follow up. So after our officers respond to, the, to a domestic call and they arrest the offender, then the offenders don't stay in jail very long. And uh, so what Gianna does and our uh, two other social workers, they work with the victim to get orders of protection. And if there's fires, firearms involved, like Tammy mentioned earlier, we have the, 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 the firearms uh, and, and, and unfortunately the, the firearm restraint, restraint of order is not used as much as I'd like. I, I think we've only used it once here in Naperville. And what that order does is it allows a family member and law enforcement to petition in front of a judge to, if we have probable cause, then we can go into that residence and seize that firearm. Unfortunately, you know, I don't think a lot of the residents, you know, understand that. So we still have to promote that, that, that restraint of order to make sure people know what it is. Mainly what we're using is order of protections. Gianna and our social workers uh, work with our victims to make sure that they, uh, that they uh, uh, get that order of protection to keep themselves safe. Also, they will help relocate individuals who are fearful of staying in the home. And I still remember a call I went on many years ago as I went on, when I was a patrol officer in which I went to a, to a, a woman's house and she, she, she had waited 18 years to leave her abusive husband. She, she, I walked into her house and she said, I, I'm, he's down in Chicago uh, working and she wrote him a note and I stood by while she uh, emptied her house of all her property. I said, you mean you li lived with like this for 18 years? She goes, yeah. And I said, why? She goes, I'm just afraid to leave him, uh, afraid of retribution. I was afraid uh, economically, you know, because he was, he supported the family. But her goal was that once those kids went to college, she was out and we helped her, helped her uh, get out. In fact, we just got a call last week from, from a woman who said, does the police department do standbys? And we said, what do you need a standby for? Well, I want to move out of my house because of my abusive husband and our social workers worked with her, got her an order of protection and we, we, we helped her. So we as law enforcement, we provide that safety for people who are in abusive relationship. And then we, uh, we work with them through the court system. And also we work with them in terms of uh, prosecution. 
because what we do is we end up, we have mandatory arrest for domestic battery in the state. That means if our officers respond to a case and we can make a case that there was a battery occurred, there, there's no, you know, solving the, the, the problem for the moment and then we come back again, you know, because I'm, if, we, if we determine there's a battery that had occurred, we're mandated by law to make an arrest. What happens sometimes when we get court, we get to court, the charges are dropped. So that's when our social workers can really work with our victims of domestic violence to ensure them that the only way this abuse is gonna stop is we, we hold the abusers accountable. So we're not gonna have obviously a full picture of how COVID has, or how domestic violence you know, has been impacted with COVID. But obviously as Chief Marshall just explained and I'm sure Tammy has may have some better numbers than me, but um, obviously the data we do have does indicate an increase and domestic violence against both women and children. Uh, for example, according to the Gun Violence Archives, in 2019, um, the number of children aged zero to 11 who were shot and injured, that number was 692. That number thus far for 2020 is 847. Um, so talking about what can be done, um, background checks on all gun purchases is something that we um, are always advocating for right now. Uh, the background check is only required on purchases that are done through a licensed gun dealer. We know that all gun purchases do not follow under that, under that, um, under that. So um, another example would be, uh, there's a bill that was already passed in the House of Representatives. It's been sitting in the Senate. It talks, it talks, it's the Charleston loophole, excuse me, the Charleston loophole, closing that up. So that talks about, um, at a federal level, if a background check takes longer than three days, they automatically get the, the background check is, is passed, it's done. Obviously states have different um, laws when it comes to that, but we believe that closing that loophole on a federal level is a huge step forward. Um, we're hoping that uh, we can still get something like that passed and have signed into law. Um, another example would be closing the boyfriend loophole. So right now federal law prohibits domestic abusers from having guns if the abuser has been married to, has lived with, or has a child in common with the victim, and it does not cover abusive dating partners. So we'd like to see that uh, loophole be closed. And then I think it's just also so important to remember um, that half of all, more than half of all mass shootings in the US are domestic violence related. And so as we talk about this, it's so important, again, as Chief Marshall um, spoke so well about, it's so important to remember the relationship between domestic violence and gun violence in America. Um, and the better we can understand that, the better we can sort of move forward and really do some good work with both aspects. When I worked in domestic violence, we found that when a victim had a good first response from the police department, they were more likely to follow through on charges or what needed to be done. So, um, and we did see a, a huge spike in domestic violence during COVID. Um, and unfortunately, people got stuck home together, people lost their jobs, you know, lots of stress. So all of those things just exacerbate what is an already bad situation. Um, so um, we yeah, definitely saw that happen. And we have been working, um, I'm very familiar with orders of protection. That's what I did for many, many years in domestic violence. And we are actually working with the folks who do orders of protection trying to work with the domestic violence folks to say, can we do anything to combine the order of protection and the FRO? Um, uh, and I firearm restraining order, which you will hear me say FRO, uh, because the FRO will have those guns removed immediately, where in order of protection, you can ask for guns to be removed, but the uh, respondent has to have a chance to come to court first before they can be removed. Um, unless the judge thinks it's really, really dangerous. And, and I was in domestic violence for 30 plus years and I only saw that happen twice. So, uh, so we're trying to really work to combine those together because the order of protection has a lot of other good remedies that the FRO does not have. And actually Illinois has one of the better domestic violence laws. So I do appreciate that. So yeah, so um, yeah, having an access to a weapon is what makes things so deadly because when in the heat of the moment, somebody will pick up a gun um, and then someone gets injured or killed. So the, our big thing is trying to get with FRO, just temporarily, let's get guns out of hands of people who are being a danger to themselves or others. Can one of you explain what a firearms restraining order is? Sure, I can. Uh, 
it is it's a court order it's a civil court order that will remove guns from a respondent who is shown to be dangerous to himself or others by um and it could be there's a domestic violence situation it could be threat of suicide it could be um, i have a mental health issue i have a substance abuse issue so it, it's just designed to get those guns temporarily removed um, and the first order is good for 14 days the second order can be good for six months and illinois is unique in that it is modeled after an order of protection it's the same a lot of the same language and it's what it can do is get that gun immediately law enforcement can assist that's what's so nice about a fro is that it doesn't have to be a family member necessarily but a law enforcement officer can apply for that um, and that's where we have to direct people if uh say it's an ex you know the big thing is my ex is trying to get my guns well actually an ex spouse or an ex-girlfriend cannot apply for a fro they would have to go through law enforcement to do so um so that is kind of a moot argument when we hear it, but we would say, you know, talk to law enforcement. If law enforcement is really astute and they're gonna know if this is definitely something that needs a fro. So, um, so yes, definitely modeled after an order of protection, same language. Uh, we expect it to hold up under court challenges when it happens. So, uh, but civil order, good for two weeks and then it can be good for up to six months and it can be extended if it needs to be. Chief Marshall, did you want to add something? Yeah, and, and I have a copy of the act right in front of me here. And I think of what it's what's important to know about it is family members and roommates can file a petition uh, to to allow law enforcement to then go to that house with a search warrant to seize those weapons. And so so it, it can be family. It doesn't always have to be in law enforcement because in law enforcement right now, and we use this all the time, we're, we're able to, if we determine there's a, that somebody's at uh, harm to themselves or others and has a firearm, we do an involuntary petition and then they, they're taken to a, a, you know, a mental health facility, but we can then seize that firearm right there. And we've, we've had to do that. We just, we did one last year where, you know, it was a domestic violence situation and we removed 18 firearms from this residence. And so, so we've had those tools in place, but this act really gives more power as Tammy indicated to family members and roommates, people who are aware of an individual that they live with that has a firearm that they are afraid of. So uh, again, we, we were trying to promote this act because I don't think a lot of people really know how to use it, but we in law enforcement, and you know that's why I, I love our three social workers because they know this stuff and they can walk uh, a family member or roommate right up to the, to the court system and, and they stand right beside them and we get these orders and then we can go and uh, execute that search warrant and remove those firearms. Last year, the Illinois General Assembly considered the Block Illegal Ownership Bill, SB 1966, that would have strengthened the FOID firearm owner's identification card system to ensure that people who are prohibited from gun possession are not able to evade the law and arm themselves, but it did not pass. Purchase of firearms by persons with a history of violence like the Aurora Henry Pratt Company workplace shooting continues in spite of laws and regulations. What can be done to prevent the sale or availability of guns to these individuals? So we were, we're definitely gonna keep up the pressure on the Illinois State Senate with that bio bill. Um, it's, a, it's a good strong bill. It covers important things like expanding background checks, requiring fingerprints with all FOID applications, and it requires action by the Illinois State Police to remove guns once a FOID is revoked. Other ways that we could achieve this would be one example is prohibiting people from purchasing guns who have been convicted of a hate crime. Another example would be people who are under outstanding warrant should be blocked from buying a gun and from having a gun if they know about the warrant. Um, those are just two more examples on top of something like a bio bill that we could do to address this. Um, and I do want to add another whole wrinkle with the COVID world and gun violence in which we're living in right now is um, there seems to be a change in emergency rules for FOID and CCL cards. And it seems like um, all the existing holder FOID holders are being automatically renewed as they apply for renewal, or, excuse me, for renewal. And that's because new applications are the focus, but those are taking over 20 weeks. So we have a situation where reputable dealers may not be comfortable ex accepting an expired 
FOID card for things like ammunition purchases, gun range practice. And this means that Illinois gun owners may be going crossing state lines to Indiana where laws are just not as strong like they are here in Illinois. So while Illinois does have, we've closed many of the loopholes in federal law by having that FOID system in place, um, we're afraid it's just not working as it should be right now. Unfortunately, Leslie is correct. We have, you know, there are still some loopholes to be closed. Um, and I think we just have to keep pushing forward with the bio bill and different laws to, you know, just keep making it tighter and tighter and tighter. Yes, we still have to figure out how to address illegal guns, uh, which is a lot of what's coming across state lines. Um, all of our uh, states surrounding us don't have as strong as laws as we do. So it's really easy to go get a gun somewhere else. So yeah, I think it's just pushing those, you know, let's get the bio bill. Unfortunately, we understand veto session has been canceled. Um, so that's probably gonna put bio bill back to square one. Uh, we're not gonna stop. We're gonna keep pressing it and, and figure out what we can do and, and do other laws. So unfortunately, uh, yeah. And, and just knowing, you know, I think we get more people on the ground doing this work. We just really need to be out there talking about it and then see what we can do to, to push bills and, you know, and then unfortunately, again, the illegal guns is what's going to get us. So we have to figure that out as well. Yeah, boy, this is something near and dear to my heart because, uh, you know, I understand there's legislation pending and, you know, uh, if we wait for legislators to get things done, you know, we'll all be, you know, very old. But uh, so in terms of, uh, 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 in terms of what we're dealing with FOID right now, uh, and based on you know uh, the Henry Pratt situation, we did a deep dive on what our department's doing with FOID. So we've linked with the uh, Illinois State Police. And uh, years ago, the Illinois State Police had a, 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 a tactical team that was responsible to go after all the revoked. I'm talking specifically the revoked FOID cards. That's where I believe we need to start. For example, in the, in the city of Naperville, right now we have 300 letters from the state police that residents in Naperville have had their FOID cards revoked. Now, because of the backlog, what we have to do is we have a 10 point plan where, where administratively we have to check, first of all, once we get these letters, the letter goes to the police department and it goes to the resident. So we are in the process right now of uh, verifying these 300 letters. Some of them are outdated and people have moved out of the state. And so it, it's trying to keep current. And again, the state police has lost a tremendous amount of resources. I think for this area, I heard there's only two, two or three maybe state police uh, detectives that are assigned to this area. So one of the things we do is we were going through these 300 letters to determine whether or not the person still lives in Naperville, still has a firearm. So there's a lot of things we can do administratively. And then last year, I went to city council and we added four officers that, that uh, compose our uh, strategic response unit. And this unit will then, once we determine the person does live in Naperville, still has firearms and their uh, FOID card has been revoked, we will be going to their residences and then taking those firearms from them. So that is what our focus on is uh, in Naperville is to go after the people who have had their FOID cards revoked. And when I went down the list of the reasons that they are having their FOID cards revoked, these are very serious crimes. It's mental health, it's committing felonies, it's uh, armed robberies and uh, crimes like that, uh, that, that their FOID cards have been revoked. So that, that has been a top priority of our uh, department and will continue to be. According to every town for gun safety since 2009, there have been 236 mass shootings. The find is four more people shot and 100, I'm sorry, 1,337 people killed. How can we restrict the use of high capacity ammunition magazines and address the problem of gun violence, but are mass shootings in schools, workplaces, and the community? Well, I think definitely uh, more legislation is needed, but we do know that sometimes FRO is helping us if we can get those arms, you know, get the guns away from the shooters. Uh, California did a study and found that they had prevented 21 mass shootings with their firearm restraining order. It's, I think it's called gun violence restraining order out there. Um, so I think some of it can be addressed through getting guns away from people through a fro who said, oh, I'm just gonna go shoot up my workplace or I'm gonna go kill somebody. Uh, so I think some of it can be prevented there. But I also think we needed to get a ban on, you know, the, the guns that 
you know, who needs an, a semi-automatic, but anybody who doesn't, you know, need that kind of capacity. So part of it's going to be a ban. And I think our fear is going to be with the Supreme Court is itching to get their hands on another Second Amendment case, because and that's been put out there. So we're, our concern would be that we would, somebody's going to pass a law, bump stock, high capacity, and then it's going to go to the Supreme Court and get shot down again. So uh, I think just strong legislation, bipartisan legislation, uh, which is what FRO was. FRO was a bipartisan legislation that happened. So if we can continue to work those inroads and do this together, then we can make this a safer place. Yeah, and uh, there's federal legislation that's been talked about and, and we in law enforcement are concerned about uh, armor piercing ammunition. This is ammunition that would go right through a police officer's bulletproof vest. That needs to be banned. Uh, silencers. We're hearing that the groups that support silencers are saying that they need silencers to protect their ears when they're on the range. Uh, there's, there's, there's other ways to protect your hearing. Silencers, just think of the shooting that was in Las Vegas. How many people's lives were saved because they heard the gunshots and they were able to flee to safety? Uh, the other thing is large capacity magazines is within that uh, group, as well as bump stocks. These are all items that must be addressed by in federal legislation. Uh, in a recent study of the Department of Justice, we also need to examine the root causes of uh, mass shootings. What, what is the number one uh, concern that, that, that the US uh, uh, Department of Justice study determined was that persons with mental illness, mental health issues was the number one trigger that, that caused individuals to, uh, to commit acts of mass violence. So you look at even our statistics here in Naperville, in 2020, we will go over uh, 1,000 mental health calls. So I think what we have to really do, and you know, I know the government is doing quite a few studies on the root causes, what drives an individual to commit acts of mass violence with firearms? What are the triggers? What are the stressors to, so that we can understand you know, what they are and then work with our uh, law enforcement partners our social service agencies to do early intervention with these individuals who have these mental health concerns that are leading to violence with firearms. The other thing too is, is in terms of prevention and math. And we have 20 officers trained in ALICE. I think everybody knows what ALICE is, alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate. So what we have to do is would we like to, in law enforcement, eliminate every single mass shooting? That's unrealistic. So what we have to do is prepare the schools, uh, prepare the businesses, like what actions are you gonna take if you're confronted with an individual who comes into your business, your school, and commits uh, uh, is an active shooting event. So we, we have trained the majority of the uh, organizations in Naperville, in the private sector, as well as the public sector, in the ALICE tr training. Uh, and anybody that would like that training, just contact our department. Again, we have uh, 20 officers certified to provide that training to, that to, to will give people the, the ability, the skills, the knowledge they need if they're confronted with an active shooting situation. So I'm going to deep dive into the whole um, high capacity ammunition thing. Um, so those are commonly defined as those capable of holding more than 10 rounds. Um, obviously, those make the shootings more deadly. Right now, nine states and DC have enacted some type of high capacity magazine prohibition. Um, we're hoping that Congress and the remaining 41 states um, would act to prohibit high capacity magazines um, to try to reduce some of the devastation of gun violence in America. In mass shootings between 2009 and 2018, events that involved high capacity um, magazines had two times as many deaths and 14 times as many injuries. Research shows us that states with restrictions on magazine size do experience mass shootings at less than half the rate of states without restrictions. Um, and another study estimated that mass shooting deaths were 70% less likely to occur when the federal prohibition on assault weapons and high capacity uh, magazines was in effect. Um, specific to school shootings, uh, you know, the most important thing that schools can do to prevent active shooter incidents and gun violence overall really is to intervene before a person commits an act of violence. Uh, threat assessment and identification programs with which there are models out there already and some very successful 
um, on assault, or excuse me, um, they allow schools to intervene to address potential violent behavior. Um, also really important when we're talking about preventing school shootings is safe, safe gun storage. And I'll get a little bit more into that um, later on. And um, I do wanna say something really quick when we talk about um, school shootings and our, uh, in that, every, that topic, um, two things always are talked about. One is arming teachers and uh, Moms Demand Action as a group is uh, against arming teachers. We see from data that shows us that putting more, bringing more guns into a school situation will make things more dangerous. Um, and then also, and I know that Chief Marshall talked about Alice, um, you know, 95% of students, well, in a normal time when kids were at school, um, you know, every day, all day, 95% of kids are going through these active shooter drills. And while it is important for business owners and teachers and principals and superintendents and those adults to have a plan and, and, and in place in the event of a mass shooting um, incident, um, data showing us that forcing these kids to go through these active shooter drills actually is doing more harm than good. So I would love to see um, a little more awareness coming from that and what we're really putting our kids through and you know if it's really even helpful. According to the Gifford Center, Center we know that 73% of children under 10 in homes with guns know where they are kept and 36% of those children have handled of those children have handled the guns. The increase in number of gun owners has increased the rate of accidental death of children and su successful suicides by gun use. How can this problem be addressed? Uh, guns in homes with kids. So what every gun owner must do is to secure and remove from homes uh, those firearms. And uh, uh, we in the city of Naperville, uh, we're moving forward earlier this year uh, on, on some legislation, a city ordinance uh, that was called the, the Child Access Protection Law, which, which would, would require individuals to safely storage, and was directed just at minors, persons 18 and younger, that would direct adults to make sure that their firearm would be secure in their home and their automobile. So that's the legislation part. Uh, some of the programs we have in Naperville uh, in terms of uh, Awareness and, and by the way, there's 22,000 suicide by firearm every single year. So it's a problem. It's an issue. It's a concern, not only with our young people, but with uh, uh, with our adults as well. Uh, for example, in the city of Naperville last year, we had uh, uh, three burglaries to vehicles, and they were uh, vehicles were stored in in, in their driveways. Uh, in those three vehicles were firearms. Those firearms were stolen, unsecured, from an unsecured uh, automobile, and those uh, firearms are now in the hands of criminals being used to commit crimes. So storage is so very important. A couple of programs we have here in the police department, we have a gun take back program, which we advertise to our residents that they can come to the Naperville Police Department and turn in firearms that they don't want anymore. For example, sometimes an, an individual will, will, will die in the home and the, the residents the residents that are still in the home said, so you know, I, I don't want these firearms. Come to the Naperville Police Department. We will destroy them and give you a record of that to destroy. We have a company that will that will melt up that down and give us a receipt for uh, destroying that firearm. The other thing we, we promoted and we implemented last year was a, a gun lock program where individuals can come to the police department and they get uh, instructions on how to use trigger locks and they can secure their firearms there. We also give them instructions on where to buy safes to keep those firearms uh, uh, out of the hands of uh, specifically children and uh, obviously adults that if they're in the, uh, you know, they're having a domestic, for example, uh, emotions are raised, that firearm is accessible, you're gonna have a, a tragic situation as a result of that. So we have to, we can do it through legislation, but we also have to do it through common sense. If, you're, if you have a firearm around your house, uh, you don't leave, leave, leave it laying around. So uh, when I looked at data, so in the last four years, we've had, uh, uh, let's see, it was 33 incidents uh, where uh, young people, people under the age, age of 18 were at risk with firearms. We had one suicide uh, by, by firearm by a 17 year old. So 
this is still a concern in our community. So we are using social media, uh, our, our Safer neighbor, neighbor campaign to continue to remind residents that if you have a firearm, you must secure it. And there's so many ways to do it. Uh, and then we, we offer that service here at the police department. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's education and awareness and, and directing people to where they can find, you know, store your guns uh, separate from your ammunition. Um, um, and I understand storing it in the car, you, you know, they probably thought it was safer, but it's not. So I think one thing we, we did earlier before the pandemic was to get information out in the Springfield area uh, through the schools to say, you know, go home and, you know, let, we're, we sent information home. We didn't ask, you know, they really didn't talk to the kids about it, but sent information home with the, to the parents about safe storage. And, and then of course we promote the Be Smart program through moms. Um, but yeah, I think again, it's just safe storage, education, awareness. Um, I know sometimes um, my organization will do um, an art contest uh, around gun violence. And, and my last suggestion was, let's talk about gun safety. Um, so I just think through those ways, we just have to keep pressing that issue along with all the other issues we're pressing. You know, I love that you mentioned sending those documents home with kids at schools. That's something that we actually, we're just starting to work on locally here before everything was locked down and you know um, priorities were a bit shifted but that's something that i'm so anxious to get back to working on uh, once things normalize again um, when we talk about unintentional shooting deaths by children those have increased by over 30 percent in the march to may period of 2020 um, these are national averages not naperville compared to the march to may average over the past three years um, a bill has been introduced in the Illinois House, it's HB 2254, known as the Illinois Safe Storage Bill. Um, it talks about, it mandates that firearms must be secure. It imposes a fine if a minor or an at-risk person or a prohibited person um, obtains the firearm and then uses it to injure or cause death or uses the firearm um, in connection with the crime. And when we talk about storing guns securely, we mean having them locked, unloaded and separate from ammunition. Um, in fact, six states in the District of Columbia, as well as several cities, including New York and San Francisco, do have laws mandating that owners secure their firearms. And as uh, both of the other panelists have, have mentioned so well, public awareness is critical to ensuring that guns are stored securely. Uh, as Tammy mentioned, Moms Demand Action, we have a Be Smart program, which is one of many models that can be used by public officials and members of the community to build awareness. Um, it's actually estimated that if half of the households with children that have at least one unlocked gun switch to locking their guns, uh, one third of youth gun suicide and unintentional deaths could be prevented. Um, and then when we talk about, uh, about suicides, um, so when a suicide uh, attempt is happens without the use of a gun, it is, successful 4% of the time. When you introduce a gun into that situation, that figure skyrockets to 90%. Uh, you know, two thirds of all gun deaths are suicides. Um, so again, how can we address this at safe storage, safe storage, safe storage is a great way. The red, you know, red flag laws can help. Um, and then one more example would be a waiting period law. And those would require a certain number of days to pass between the purchase of a gun and then when the buyer could actually take possession is it could create a buffer between someone having a suicidal crisis and access to a gun. How do people who are victims of domestic violence even um, know that there are services available? Well, I think it's either the organizations themselves like uh, domestic violence programs who get their information out to the public or one thing, uh, if, if you suspect someone is a victim of domestic violence, just uh, perhaps giving them some information. Um, when I worked in domestic violence, we used to have, we had these t-shirts that we wore that said, you can talk to me about domestic violence. Um, and I thought, that's nah, never going to work. You would not believe how many people approached me in Walmart to talk about domestic violence. So I think just knowing, uh, that's why you see posters on the back of bathroom doors and women's rooms. Uh, just kind of putting the word out there secretly to, hey, if you're having this is issue, you can call this number, which is usually a hotline. So I think just, you know, hopefully people are talking and, you know, when they're seeing these posters and, or they know somebody who's been in that same situation and they know they went for help. 
Yeah, and also one of our social workers came up with a crisis hotline and uh, that's available to anybody and you can call anonymously there and uh, uh, that hotline allows uh, whatever the issue is. It could be domestic violence, could be a mental health issue, could be somebody even thinking about committing suicide. So that hotline was set up through our social services department. Leslie, could you please elaborate on how the active shooter drills have done more harm than good? Yes. So after I, I'm going to link. Um, um, so every town just actually came out this fall with a report that they, a very extensive report that they did on active shooter drills. So I'm going to link that um, here because it's quite long and I'm not going to paraphrase the whole thing. And I think it's really, it's something that you, uh, especially if you have a child from kindergarten to um senior, you know, 12th grade, it's something that you should really be aware of. But just to sort of like give you an example, um, active shooter drills in schools are associated with increases in depression, stress and anxiety, and physiological health problems, um, including children from as young as five up to high schoolers, their parents, and their teachers. Um, concerns over death increased by 22%. Um, you know, within those 90 days after a school drill, um, you know, school shootings make up about, I think it's something like point here, only 0.2%, so again, 0.2% of gun deaths each year occur on school grounds, but yet we've got 95% of all students going through these. So um, again, what, you know, we need to have a more trauma-informed approach and um, we never have the types of drills where they actually mimic an incident, which I know we've all seen on the news. I just want to uh, say about our ALICE training, we have three different programs and they're tailored for their age appropriate. So for example, when, when we're training adults on the ALICE program, it's, com it's a completely different program than we would use with young people. Just from what Leslie said, we don't want to traumatize them. When we're doing it with the adults, we do actually, we put them in scenarios where they have to make decisions if an active shooter comes in. We don't do that same type of training with young people. Um, please discuss the difference between peaceful demonstrations and protests versus riots, vandalism, and violence. I guess that's mine, right? <laughs> so uh, our job as a police department is uh, to protect uh, everyone's First Amendment rights, which means that they have the absolute uh, right to peacefully assembly and protest. That's the First Amendment. And... Uh, as long as people are obeying all the laws and ordinances, that's a peaceful demonstration. Now, as we saw June 1st in Naperville, it started off as a very peaceful protest about the death of George Floyd up in Minneapolis. And there were three to 400 people peacefully demonstrating in Naperville from three o'clock all the way to about seven o'clock. And then there was individuals that we determined you know, through our intelligence information that came from outside Naperville with the express purpose of committing acts of violence and crimes. So that quickly changed from a peaceful demonstration. Again, the majority of the people that were in Naperville June 1st, uh, hundreds of them were there to peacefully protest with signs. Uh, they were walking in uh, sidewalks. They were in the streets. We as the police department, we were very tolerant, even though it's unlawful to, to block intersections and to be on the streets. We were very tolerant. We, we allowed that to occur because they were peaceful. When individuals came and they committed acts of violence, such as throwing explosives at our police officers, damaging and looting 35 of our businesses, that was clearly not a peaceful demonstration. And we've made several arrests for those individuals who committed those crimes. So I, I think the, the definition is, uh, again, based on what, what's in the constitution, to lawfully assemble and peacefully protest, nonviolent, as Martin Luther King proposed many years ago. Uh, he was a proponent of nonviolence. Uh, and uh, the, the, we as a police department, we, we, we promote that. And there, it's our main responsibility to ensure the First Amendment rights of everybody who, did, who ended up uh, protesting and demonstrating in Naperville. Are ghost guns or homemade guns a problem in our area and how can we control this? You know, I, I've heard that about ghost guns and homemade guns. Uh, we, we, we've had a couple of those here in Naperville, but not to the extent that we're seeing crimes being committed with 
uh, illegal firearms. Um, if you could change one issue related to gun violence, what would be your priority? I think the major thing I want and just wish people could understand is that um, one of the biggest issues we face in this country is the amount of guns we have and the easy access there are to them. But you know, if more guns meant safer communities, America would be the safest country in the world. We all know that that's not the case. The US gun homicide rate is 25 times higher than that of other high income countries. Um, you know, we, we've got to start somewhere and just doing, I just feel like right now we're kind of just doing the bare minimum and it's, and it's hard. We've, we've got a lot of pushback and, you know, political stuff aside, um, we just, we have to start somewhere. And the more we can advocate um, for stronger laws and especially around how to safely store firearms, um, the better off we would all be for sure safer we'd be. Well, right now for me, if one thing would be if I could make everybody in this state understand what a firearm restraining order was and how to use it, how to get it, then I would be happy. Um, so, uh, but I, I also echo what Leslie said, you know, the, the amount of guns is just, it's horrific. And when you read cases where we had a gun, we didn't have a gun removed, we had seven guns removed, or we had 20 guns removed. Um, and I hear those statistics and I think, my God, why do you need 20 guns? Um, but apparently people do. So I just think uh, I would echo what she said as well. Uh, let's see, the one thing that we in law enforcement and me specifically are concerned with is uh, the amount of violent offenders that continue to commit violent crimes with firearms over and over again. We are catching the same people over and over again. And uh, uh, some statistics here. Firearm offenders, according to the U.S. Sentencing Commission, over two-thirds, that's 68% of the firearm offenders, are rearrested for, for a similar or another crime when they get out of jail or prison. So that is, that is a huge amount. So what we're seeing here in Naperville is repeat offenders. That, and, and these guns are not lawfully purchased. These are illegal, illegally possessed firearms that are being used to commit crimes by offenders that continue to not be held accountable through the criminal justice system. And that is the one thing I would like to change because we in law enforcement, we're, we're, we will continue to do it, but we're tired of catching the same people over and over again and seeing them get out of jail the next day. For example, a recent study in New York City, one of the most uh, violent cities in, in America with, with gun violence right up there with Chicago uh, in 2020, there's prisoners that are arrested or individuals who are arrested for a gun crime are spending an average of 11 days in jail and then they're out again. That is That must change in terms of keeping our communities safe because these people are committing violent acts, whether they're armed robberies, shootings. We've seen uh, in the last couple of years here in Naperville, street crime involving offenders shooting, you know, uh, whether it's an argument over uh, domestic type situation or drug ripoffs are using firearms. And these are individuals that have long criminal histories. The, 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 uh, the prison systems, uh, the governor's office, uh, the criminal justice system, the prosecutors, uh, the judges must hold these people accountable for the violent crimes they are committing with firearms. So that's the one thing I would like to change, see changed here is more accountability, more consequences for those who commit crimes and victimize our residents with firearms. And then the other thing I wanna say is that the governor's office just came out with uh, uh, seven reform, criminal justice reform principles. One of the things uh, us and uh, we in Illinois chiefs were disappointed in those reform efforts was there was no mention of anything for the victims of crimes. That's the victims of domestic violence, the domestic uh, mental health, or the, uh, or the victims of violent crimes. There was no mention in his reform about anything to do with the victims. And, and that is a shame. 